Sir Isaac Newton was the founding father of theoretical physics. But here I want to talk about a numerical method that's named for him. Newton's method can quickly find the zeros of a nonlinear function. But Newton's method can also create beautiful fractals. My name is Jeff Chasnov, and I'm a professor of mathematics. If you have a quick search on the web, you can find many beautiful Newton fractals. But what's the history of this fractal? How do you create the fractal? And why does it look the way it does? The history goes all the way back to 1879, before fractals were even defined. In the very second volume of the American Journal of Mathematics, Professor Arthur Cayley of Cambridge University proposed what later became the Newton fractal problem. Professor Cayley considered a function of a complex variable and proposed to find the roots of this function using Newton's method. Newton's method requires an initial guess for the root, and since a function may have more than one root, Professor Cayley wanted to know which initial guesses converge to which roots. He found a solution for the quadratic equation, but could not find any solution for the cubic equation. The last sentence of his one-page paper is a classic English understatement. The solution is easy and elegant in the case of a quadric equation, but the next succeeding case of the cubic equation appears to present considerable difficulty. So much difficulty, in fact, that the cubic equation took another hundred years to solve because it required both the invention of computers and computer graphics. In 1976 Paris, Professor John Hubbard was teaching a first-year calculus course. Here's his own story that he told ten years after. About ten years ago, at the birth of computer graphics, mathematicians started seeing extraordinary pictures appearing on their computer screens. My name is John Hubbard. I'm a mathematician. I first ran into such pictures about 10 years ago when I was teaching elementary calculus at the University of Paris. 10 years ago there were computers, but there weren't very many and they were not available to undergraduate students. There were programmable calculators, however, and I cast around for a while to find programs that were sufficiently simple that one could in fact program them on a programmable calculator and at the same time led to interesting results. The most obvious candidate was Newton's method, an algorithm designed by Newton, therefore very old, and I thought at that time well understood. 1976 was a time before color screens and color printers. What Professor Hubbard actually did was print some X's, zeros, and ones. We can see what computer graphics were like back in those days by looking at a paper from a conference held in 1978. This paper contains what perhaps is the most famous illustration of this type of computer graphics, the very first published image of the Mandelbrot set. We can do amazing things now with computer graphics. Let's have a closer look at the Newton fractal. We can zoom into this flower. Here we see a flower with a blue inside and with its point on the right. Let's take a picture and continue to zoom. Here's the same flower again. Let's take another picture. If we compare these two flowers, we see that they are identical. We say that the Newton fractal is self-similar and contains copies of itself on smaller and smaller scales. Self-similarity is a basic property of fractals. Let's try and answer two fundamental questions. The first question is relatively easy, how to compute the Newton fractal. The second question is relatively hard, why does it look like it does? I started teaching the Newton fractal to students more than 20 years ago, and the answer to that second question even surprised me. To understand the Newton fractal, we first have to understand Newton's method. Newton's method is the fastest numerical method to find the roots of a function. 
You start off with an initial guess, x0, and then you compute x1, x2, x3, and so on until the sequence converges to the root. Let's see how Newton's method is derived. We start with some general function y equals f of x. Here is the root of the function, where f of x equals 0. Suppose we're at the nth iteration of Newton's method with the value x sub n. To find the n plus first iteration, we approximate the function at x sub n by its tangent line. The intersection of the tangent line with the x-axis gives us the value x sub n plus 1. The derivative of f of x can give us the slope of the tangent line, and the point-slope formula can give us an equation for the line. If we then find where the line intersects the x-axis, we can derive the iteration formula for Newton's method. x sub n plus 1 equals x sub n minus f of x sub n divided by f prime of x sub n. To create the Newton fractal, we need to apply Newton's method to find the cube roots of unity. What are the cube roots of unity? They're the numbers that when you cube them, you get 1. We all know 1 cubed equals 1, so 1 is a cube root of unity. We can find two other cube roots of unity using complex numbers. But first, let's derive Newton's method. Instead of using x, let's use the variable z and solve z cubed equals 1, or z cubed minus 1 equals 0. Newton's iteration formula then becomes z sub n plus 1 equals z sub n minus f of z sub n divided by f prime of z sub n, with f of z equals z cubed minus 1, and f prime of z equals 3 times z squared. Newton's method then becomes the iteration equation z sub n plus 1 equals z sub n minus z sub n cubed minus 1 divided by 3 times z sub n squared. We can also find the analytical solutions to z cubed equals 1. We'll need to make use of complex numbers. The imaginary number i satisfies i squared equals minus 1. A complex number z is written as x plus i y where x and y are real numbers, and x is the real part of z, and y is the imaginary part of z. We can locate a complex number as a point in the complex plane with the x-axis, the real part of z, and the y-axis, the imaginary part of z. It's easy to locate the four fourth roots of unity that solve z to the fourth equals 1. We know that 1 to the 4th equals 1, and minus 1 to the 4th equals 1. But the imaginary numbers work also. i to the 4th is just i squared times i squared equals minus 1 squared equals 1, and minus i to the 4th is also equal to 1. We can plot the four fourth roots of unity in the complex plane, and then draw the unit circle passing through these points. We can see that these four roots are evenly distributed on the unit circle. The three cube roots of unity are also evenly distributed on the unit circle and make an angle 2 pi over 3 with the positive real axis. Some simple trigonometry gives us the three roots. r1 equals 1, r2 equals minus 1 half plus i square root of 3 over 2, and r3 equals minus 1 half minus i square root of 3 over 2. So how does one compute the Newton fractal? First, we grid up the complex plane. Here's a small 11 by 11 grid. Let me color the grid point containing the first root red, the second root green, and the third root, blue. We'll take starting values for Newton's method at all the grid points. Let's look at this one first. After one iteration, we end up here. 
After two iterations, we end up here. After three iterations, here. And after four iterations, we already end up in the grid cell that is colored blue. Newton's method does converge to this third root, so we can color the grid cell of the starting value blue. We can follow the same procedure for all the grid cells and color each of them. The black grid cell in the middle contains the zero grid point, and Newton's method doesn't converge there because the derivative of the function is zero. The large red, green, and blue regions make sense because these starting values are close to the roots that they converge to. But something interesting is happening in the regions between the roots. Those iterates move towards zero and then can jump anywhere in the complex plane. Let's refine the grid and see how the Newton fractal emerges. We can start slowly and then speed up. By the time we get to a thousand by a thousand grid, the Newton fractal is pretty well converged. This calculation takes almost no time on my computer. The function f of z equals z cubed minus 1 is a complex function, and it's hard to see what's exactly going on during a Newton's iteration. So let's first have a look at the real function f of x equals x cubed minus 1. Here is a graph of that cubic polynomial. The single real root is located at x equals 1. Let's follow a Newton's iteration with x naught equals 1.5. Here is the first iteration, and here is the second iteration. After a couple of more iterations, Newton's method converges to the root. We can see how Newton's method behaves for different starting values by looking at the first iterations. Let's start at x naught equals 2. As we decrease x naught, the value of x1 gets closer and closer to the root. We cross the root when x naught equals 1. As we decrease x naught further, x1 moves farther and farther away from the root until we obtain a horizontal tangent line when x naught equals 0. As we decrease x0 to negative values, x1 again moves closer to the root, crosses the root, and then becomes negative. Let me point out some interesting values of x0. There is a special value of x0 equals minus 1 half, which converges to the root with only one iteration. But more importantly, the value x0 equals 0 doesn't converge. We say that x0 equals 0 is an escape point of the iteration because the iteration shoots off to infinity. There are other escape points. The value x0 around negative 0.8 is also an escape point because it ends up at x equals 0 after one iteration. So is the value x0 around negative 1.4 because it ends up at x equals 0 after two iterations. In fact, there are an infinite number of escape points lying on the negative x-axis. Let's have a look at the first seven escape points and see where these escape points lie on the Newton fractal. They're the endpoints of the fractal flowers that line up on the real axis. Let's zoom into an escape point. We see an endless number of flowers going into this point where all three colors meet. In fact, these escape points are everywhere in the complex plane. To find all the escape points, we need to invert the Newton iteration. Instead of starting at the value z sub n and asking where it goes after one Newton iteration, we start at the value z sub n and ask where it came from. What we do is take the usual Newton iteration and swap the variables z sub n and z sub n plus 1. For the Newton fractal, this becomes a cubic equation for z sub n plus 1. If we start with z naught equals 0, 
we can find three values of z1 that lie in the complex plane. The first is our real root, and the other two are complex. We can see where these complex roots lie on the fractal. We then iterate the cubic equation to find another nine escape points. Every subsequent iteration will give us three times more escape points. The set of all escape points is called the Julia set of the Newton fractal. Gaston Julia was a French mathematician born in 1893 and who received the Grand Prize of France at the age of 25. Unfortunately, he had suffered an injury to his nose in World War I. By the time he died in 1978, the Julia set had been made famous by Benoit Mandelbrot in his pioneering study of fractal geometry. So let's try and understand why the Newton fractal looks the way it does. First, let's examine the rotational symmetry of the fractal. The cube roots of unity are evenly distributed on the unit circle. By rotating the circle an angle 2 pi over 3, we can see that the fractal image is invariant, provided we change the colors so that red becomes green, green becomes blue, and blue becomes red. Actually, it's possible to construct the entire fractal by considering only one of the roots. Let's start with the region that converges to the real root, colored red. On top of this, we can place a green image, and on top of that, we can place a blue image. We can then rotate the green image and angle 2 pi over 3 counterclockwise, and the blue image and angle 2 pi over 3 clockwise. So starting from just the solution for the real root, we can construct the entire Newton fractal. Next, let's try and understand the radial symmetry of the fractal. Observe how the fractal pattern repeats itself radially. This is the inner circle, or first ring. This is the second ring. And this is the third ring. The ring structure continues to infinity. Now, let's focus on the third ring. We can iterate Newton's method once for all the grid points in this ring and map their colors to wherever they go. Although the solid red, green, and blue regions are a bit distorted, we see that the flowers in the third ring are mapped exactly into the flowers in the second ring. If we now focus on the second ring, and iterate Newton's method, we see that its flowers are mapped into the flowers in the inner circle. So the infinite number of flowers in the outer rings are all mapped inward one ring with one Newton iteration. That leaves us with a really interesting question to answer. What happens to all the flowers in the innermost ring after one Newton iteration? To make the results clear, will map a single flower. After one iteration, this single flower is mapped to the entire right side of the fractal. What exactly is going on? Let me try and show you how the mapping works. The large red region has now moved into the non-fractal red region and is no longer part of a flower. The top branch of flowers with large blue insides, has mapped to this infinitely long upper branch of the fractal. The first flower here maps to the first flower here, the second flower here maps to the second flower here, and so on. And the bottom branch of flowers, with large green insides, maps to this lower branch of the fractal. We see that the fractal is all connected, Outer ring flowers are connected to the next inner ring flower, and the innermost ring flower is connected to the non-fractal region and the opposite fractal branches. We're now in a position to follow any point on the fractal 
after a Newton iteration. Let's pick a random point on the Newton fractal, say here, and follow its Newton iterations. Because this point is located in the second ring, it moves inward one ring after one Newton iteration. Now the point is in the first ring, and its flower gets mapped to the other side. The point is still in the first ring, and its flower again gets mapped to the other side. Finally, the point gets mapped to the red non-fractal region and converges directly to the real root. We now see why the Newton fractal is self-similar and where every point on the fractal moves after one Newton iteration. Let's see if this generalizes to higher roots of unity. Here's our familiar Newton fractal from the three cube roots of unity. Here's the Newton fractal from the four fourth roots of unity. The Newton fractal from the five fifth roots of unity and the Newton fractal from the six sixth roots of unity. The rotational symmetry of all the fractals is easy to understand, as is the radial symmetry with flowers extending to infinity. Let's look more closely at the fractal for the four fourth roots of unity and see if we can figure out how an innermost flower maps after one Newton iteration. Let's see how this flower maps. The red inner region maps to this non-fractal red region, and the yellow inner region maps to this non-fractal yellow region. This upper line of flowers maps to this line of flowers. This middle line of flowers maps to this line of flowers. And this lower line of flowers maps to this line of flowers. Fractal images, like our Newton fractals, can be created from abstract mathematics, but nature also likes beautiful fractals, like the frost patterns on a glass, the shoreline of a lake, and the fantastic Romanesco broccoli. I'm Jeff Chasnov. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video. Thank you.